On August 4th, 1984, the New York Times ran a news story titled, Selective Service to Stop Use of Birthday List. The story begins. The Selective Service System today defended its use of a mailing list compiled by a national chain of ice cream stores to advise young men that they were liable for draft registration. However, a Selective Service spokesman, Will Ebel, said the government was returning the computerized list of 167,000 names to the company. The use of this commercial list was entirely appropriate and we don't have any moral qualms, he said. But it appears the list broker may have sold us the names without the permission of the originator. And in these circumstances, we feel it best not to use them. As it turned out, Farrell's Ice Cream Parlor restaurant, a chain of almost 100 ice cream stores, was unaware of the list they had compiled and sold to another party, sold the list to the Selective Service without their express written consent. In December 2015, The Guardian reported that Cambridge Analytica was working for United States Senator Ted Cruz using data harvested from millions of people's Facebook accounts without their consent. These two stories share a common theme. Data is being used without consent and with little knowledge of the owner. Has nothing changed in the 21 years between stories? Have we not progressed and learned from previous incidents? Are these two incidents and the impact of the incidents the same? In the ice cream example, the purchase list contained 167,000 names. In the Cambridge Analytica example, Facebook confirmed Cambridge had data on potentially over 87 million users. Has digital media made the problem better or worse? These are just two examples of misuse of data. With a simple Google search, we could find hundreds more. Digital media can harvest data for many good things, including help solve problems, get people matched to their personal needs and interests, and use resources. It can also exacerbate problems, mislead the public, and take advantage of people for undesirable things. In The Ethics of Invention, Technology, and the Human Future, Sheila Jasanoff tells us the Internet has provided us with a freedom to express ourselves at virtually no cost. Jasanoff says, That freedom, however, comes with a potential for control that the pioneers of virtual space did not entirely foresee. Digital transactions, especially in the interactive Web 2.0 era, are two-way streets. By putting oneself into cyberspace, one opens the way to pervasive and perpetual observation. As intelligence contractor Edward Snowden revealed in 2013 through his massive data leak of NSA documents, our electronic communications are not shielded against warrantless searches by the government to the extent U.S. citizens once believed them to be. Nor is the state the only watchful actor. A giant commercial marketplace like Amazon places the goods of the world at the buyer's fingertips. In return, however, Amazon gets to record an entire history of purchases and preferences, to aggregate it over time, to sort it with algorithms, and to create a picture of each user as a potential target for advertisers and sellers of commodities beyond those the user originally accessed. Google, similarly, maintains records of each user's searches, and as we will see below, it can and does scan the emails of users of Gmail for illegal content. Users, moreover, no longer simply seek information and become unwitting data sources. They also share information intentionally via social networking sites like Facebook, Flickr, YouTube, Pinterest, and Twitter. The range of people one shares with in the free-flowing medium of cyberspace is not wholly within the sharer's control. In A Gift of Fire, Sarah Basset reminds us about the Fourth Amendment. Basset states, The Fourth Amendment sets limits on the government's right to search our homes and businesses and to seize documents and other personal effects. It requires that the government have probable cause for the search and seizure. That is, there must be good evidence to support 
specific search. Two key problems arise from new technologies. First, much of our personal information is no longer safe in our homes or the individual offices of our doctors and financial advisors. We carry a huge amount of personal information on smartphones and laptops. Much personal information is in huge databases outside of our control. Many laws allow law enforcement agencies to get information from non-government databases without a court order. Federal privacy rules allow law enforcement agencies to access medical records without court orders. And Jasinoff tells us more about the non-government databases. She says, the term data oligarch has been applied to companies such as Google and Facebook. They open unparalleled information gateways to the masses, but they also control masses of information whose very scope and variety give them enormous potential value. Though technically private or non-state, these companies straddle a line that makes it difficult for states to hold them accountable for data use or misuse. Is all hope lost? Can we really know what we are consenting to when we click on the terms of agreement or privacy statements, websites, and service providers present to us? Is it possible to use any online service without consenting to giving away all of our personal data? What can we do to help ourselves understand the complexities of data and social media? And how can we best control the use of our own personal data? How can we ensure fair consent, protection, sharing, and archiving of our data? Some areas to consider include privacy, preserving fairness, social cohesion, bias, power and inequality concerns, and data cleansing. With data, what are the privacy concerns? Does the digital media provided have a privacy statement? Is it in terms easy to understand? Privacy advocates have developed various sets of principles for protection of personal data. They are often called fair information principles or fair information practices. We can look at the list of principles to help us determine how the service provider is handling our personal data and how they intend to use it. Social cohesion suggests we look at how we are connected to each other and how well we ensure people of our community are not marginalized. Is the data reliable? Is it shared? If so, how? Fixing data errors such as credit ratings can be a nightmare. How are the data errors corrected when there is a strong permanence to the digital record? Data mining, data collection, and data use are growing at alarming rates. Can we trust government and the private sector with our data? In Weapons of Math Destruction, Kathy O'Neill begs the question, she asks, when statistics itself and the public's trust in statistics is being actively undermined by politicians across the globe, how can we possibly expect the big data industry to clarify rather than contribute to the noise? 